Hi, this is Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish. And this is the DM's Deep Dive right here on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Uh, in this show, I usually try to find an expert in Dungeons & Dragons who we can talk to about one particular topic. Uh, I wasn't really able to find an expert this time, but I did think that it was time to bring Jeremy Crawford on board. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I am uh, Jeremy Crawford. I'm the lead rules designer of Dungeons & Dragons, the lead designer of a book people might have heard of before called The Player's Handbook. Uh, and I am also D&D's managing editor, which means I oversee the publication of every book for Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> I, uh, I I kid, of course. I was, I was talking to my wife on a walk just before this show, and I said, you know, I'm pretty sure maybe there are five people in the world who have thought of about Dungeons and Dragons as as much as Jeremy, but it could even be less than that. So I, I thank you very much for coming onto the show. For for, oh, for us to be able to to pick your brain on this matter is a great honor. And of course, you're 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 bringing a lot of joy to the world. So thank you, thank you very much for all that you do. Oh, thank it's, you for saying so. Um, so today we're going to talk about monsters in particular. Uh, I love monsters, and I think that they are obviously. Uh, they account for one third of the uh, total, you know, the, the core books. So they are a topic I think uh, worth worth diving into. Um, I do mention for for folks, if you are on YouTube, if you're on Twitter or in Twitch, it's too late. But there are two really good videos worth watching. Uh, one is an episode of Dragon Talk that Jeremy Crawford did with Greg Tito, uh, talking about encounter building advice, and I highly recommend. Uh, it, it kind of it really got me thinking differently about kind of Dungeons and Dragons overall, but certainly about um, um, monster design and encounter building. Uh, and the other one is uh, Mike Merles on his show, The Happy Fun Hour, recently built a monster from scratch. And um, so one of the I'll, 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 well, I'm going to hang on to this question, uh, but that is a video very much worth watching. Um, but I always like to start the show with kind of getting right into some useful tips that Dungeon Masters can can use right away. Uh, and I want to ask them to you, uh, what three tips do you have for DMs to get the most out of D&D monsters? So, oh man, and I thought about this in advance and it was really hard for me to boil it down to just three. Excellent. Uh, so the first tip I would give is remember that each monster is far more than a sack of hit points. Mm -hmm. A monster is a character, really. And every monster is not only a role-playing opportunity for the DM, uh, but is also a story-building block. Often when I'm coming up with the ideas for an upcoming D&D session, often what I will do is just sit down with the Monster Manual or now Volo's Guide to Monsters or Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, just flip through and see which monsters spark my imagination. Sometimes a monster will have a little story bit that can spawn not only an entire adventure session, but maybe an entire mini campaign or an entire you know, maxi campaign. Uh, also, I mentioned every monster uh, is a role-playing opportunity. So often when I bring monsters to the table, I'm looking for a way to make the monsters funny or scary or memorable in some way because of some imperious thing they said or some ridiculous thing they said. Uh, I look for ways to mon for monsters to dispense story information, uh, often in the midst of combat. Uh, often I like to tell people to remember the story doesn't have to stop when initiative is rolled. Uh, right. The story can keep on going, whether you're telling that story through what the monsters are saying and doing, or you're doing it through the environment around them. Because that's the other thing, uh, uh, going along with this theme of they're more than a sack of hit points, Monsters often imply an environment. And so just your monster choice can have this ripple effect uh, in your adventure design, your campaign design, and your role playing. Uh, so that was just one tip. Uh, the second tip I would give is, and, and Mike, you've heard me say this many times before, adjust numbers on the fly. Because <laughs> uh, one of the things that it's really easy to forget as a DM is your players don't see what's behind the screen. It's one of the reasons why playing with the DM screen uh, is so traditional for the game. But even if you don't have a DM screen, let's say you're, you're keeping track of things on your laptop or in an iPad or even in a little notebook that you can sort of pick up and look at, you're always going to have some place where the players don't see what the hit points are, what the AC is, how much damage the monster can deal. It's on purpose that they can't see that because 
even if you have players who have the monster manual memorized and they know hobgoblins <laughs> have this many hit points and they deal this amount of damage on average, really what they have in their mind is the platonic ideal of the hobgoblin. I often like to think of what we put in our monster books, that's the platonic ideal. When you actually meet a hobgoblin, you're, making, you're meeting a real hobgoblin. You're not meeting necessarily the ideal that's in the monster manual. You're meeting a hobgoblin that might have way more hit points than the average. Uh, you're meeting a hobgoblin that might deal way more or way less damage than is normal for a hobgoblin. The point is, as a DM, adjust on the fly to make your combats memorable and appropriate for the story moment. You might find you want a fight that's a cakewalk. You might have, you know, one of those moments where you kind of, you want the player's blood to get rolling a little bit. Maybe your session is sort of flagging a little bit and you're like, all right, I want some quick, easy excitement. Combat's often a great way to do that. But you don't want that combat to drag on too long. You just kind of want to remind uh, your players, oh, there's some danger in the world. Uh, these bugbears show up, you have a little quick skirmish and it's over. You might decide these bugbears have fewer than average hit points. These bugbears are kind of weak and not dealing as much damage. Adjust that on the fly. Uh, often something I do too, if I feel like a combat is dragging on too long, many DMs have seen this situation where someone deals damage and this monster in this fight that's going on a little too long is left with two hit points. I often will make those two hit points disappear. And again, your players don't know those two hit points are still there. Uh, and always remember, you're not cheating as a dungeon master, because when you look in the stat block and you see the hit point section up top, remember, we give you a number of hit points, but right next to it in parentheses, we give you the monster's hit dice and the monster's constitution contribution to their hit points. That number within that parentheses is an important tool for you as a DM. It represents a range of possibility for that monster from you know, the lower end to the average, which is what we print next to the parentheses, and then all the way up to the upper end. And so if, if you want your monsters to get out of the way faster, well then just go, you know, down, uh, go down in the range. If on the other hand, you want this fight to be scary and you feel like, ah, this is a little too easy, maybe your, maybe your player characters are a little more powerful than uh, the system expects, well, then up those hit points. Again, you're not cheating as a DM when you do this. The system is designed for you to have this dial to turn up and down. You can do the same thing with damage. Uh, if you want your monsters to hit like a wet noodle, go below the average damage. And you'll notice that in, in our stat blocks, just like with hit points, we print a number right next to it in parentheses. There's then a range of possibility. As a DM, you can go anywhere in that range of possibility. If you want the monsters to be doing minimum damage all the time, go for it. If you want your monsters to be dealing maximum damage all the time, go for it. Although that's going to be terrifying. <laughs> and you might have some, you might have some deadly consequences uh, to deal with. Uh, but again, you are you are playing within the parameters that the game is designed to have. Uh, we, we, we often provide you, and especially when it's a DM facing element of the game, we provide you with a range of possibility. We default to the average and the game is sort of fine tuned for the average, but you as DM, you in essence are not only a storyteller, but you also are sort of the, you're the, the system master. So you can adjust the system on the fly in a way we can't do remotely from Wizards of the Coast. You as a DM can see because of this mix of character classes, this mix of magic items, this number of player characters, things are going a little weird relative to the system's expectations. It's why we give you these dials so that you can adjust to get just the right feeling you want. All right, so that was just, that was, so that was tip number two. These are, uh, these are fantastic. <laughs> just, so, so in summary, again, that was adjust the numbers. The previous one is monsters are more than a bag of hit points. They're also right, right. They're, they're pieces of story. Okay, so my final one, uh, this was a simple one, and this is not so much a tip about monsters, but really a tip to DMs to be kind to yourself. And this tip, I, this tip uh, for me is my monsters have bad days too. Uh, because 
almost any DM, if you've been DMing long enough, you have that experience where you run some encounter and you thought, I really thought that was going to be a really different experience than it was. And then after the session, you go back and you look at the stat block and you're like, oh my God, this creature had immunity to cold damage and they killed it with Ray of Frost. You know, you like you, you have that kind of, oh no, moment. Monsters have bad days too, because player characters also will have bad days. Players will sometimes forget abilities their character have. I often just, I just chalk it up to, just like in, in real life, we make, we often make weird mistakes in our lives. We'll forget strengths we have, or resources we have. The same is true for player characters, the same is true for monsters. Don't torture yourself as a DM if you forgot this thing. I often love to use that as an opportunity for a second chance. Like, oh, right, you know, there, there was, you know, Bob the Minotaur, who was just a hot mess because I as DM forgot half his abilities. So next time, Bob's sister Charlotte is going to show up and she is going to clean their clocks <laughs> because I'm going to remember all of Charlotte's abilities and I might even up her potency a bit to make up for how how uh, pathetic Bob was. Um, so again, uh, keep in mind that everything you're doing is storytelling, even your use of the system. And I, I often like to say, use adversity as an opportunity to tell an even better story. Even if that's adversity you've brought on yourself as a DM because you forgot something, or maybe the plan that you had just perhaps wasn't as good as it could have been for this particular group of characters, this particular story you're telling. One of the beauties of a campaign is every session you have a chance to do something different and better. Uh, that's that's one of the things I love about D&D is you as a storyteller get to evolve over the course of your own campaign. You as a storyteller get to use the monsters you're using better and better, the locations you're using better and better. It's this endless learning opportunity. There's I, I often think D&D has this optimism uh, built into its very core. It's about things can always get better. Because you think about it, even the narrative for player characters is they can always get better. They're going to level up. They're going to get more powerful. They're going to get smarter. They might even get more charismatic. Uh, it, it, the game is all about improvement. And so not just on the game side, but even in us, those who are DMing it and who are playing it. All right, so those are my three tips. Those are those are excellent. And um, so one, one quick, quick follow up question on the on the numbers. Um, so you and I talked about um, hit points being flexible within the, the the range, and I asked you on Twitter about damage in particular because that's something that I've been doing. I've been kind of just you know I'm like I've already been switching up the average to high on monsters. Yeah, can I do that with damage too? And it does build these really scary monsters, and sometimes. Oh. Again, based on the pacing of the battle, I might lower the hit points, but increase the damage because I want them to hit like freight trains, but die quick. Um, but I guess I, I'm also in my mind, I'm kind of saying like, OK, well, I know I can do anything like I could just double their hit points or double their damage, which is outside of scope. So I, I like to think like, well, what's inside scope? So is is the you know, is 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 maxing damage in particular, like maxing hit points is one thing because. It's like, well, they rolled really well once, you know, but damage, they're rolling all the time and we're pushing that, you know, we're pushing the mean pretty high Yeah. if they're hitting, you know, max every time. Do, so, do you feel like that goes outside of the bounds that you had when you were designing the monsters or is that, you know, is that still within the bounds? So, so it's within bounds, but oh boy, are you up against the edge. <laughs> yeah, right, you're right at the... And, and again, I would yeah. say only do it if you are monitoring round by round the effect right. that that's having on the group. Right, uh, right. But, but it again, is, it is literally uh, within the range of possibility that we have put in the stat block. Uh, right. And so, again, you're not cheating, you're not going to break the game, but again, you might, you might uh, wipe out some of the characters uh, inadvertently. So... I think it's great that when you do it, you are keeping an eye on <laughs> round. Sometimes, round. <laughs> sometimes it gets a little hard. I'm like, wow, that guy went down fast. Um, so I, I have to ask. You said that you had a list of things and it was hard to get down to three. Did you have a fourth that you're absolutely dying to bring up? So, uh, so the fourth actually, I cheated and folded it into number one, and that was using monsters as the seeds uh, for adventure design, yeah. Uh, yeah. Be because. I, I both as a DM and as a designer, love monsters more than almost anything else in D&D. &D. Uh, I mean, I think 
part of that goes back to the fact that, you know, I started D&D with first edition and the first of the three books was the monster manual. Uh, and th to me, there is still something magical about paging through a bestiary and, and in my mind, populating a story and a world with all of these crazy creatures. And then also trying to come up with ways that they might coexist and pondering how bizarre the worlds are that have all these creatures in them. I mean, you know, creatures that can disintegrate people with rays and control other people's minds. Uh, I mean, D&D worlds are really bizarre places. <laughs> when you think of, you think of the, the ecologies that produced uh, these strange creatures. Uh, now, of course, the story we always have for D&D &D that we can fall back on is, well, various divine beings did it, or as you know, we often like to shorten that to just a wizard did it. Yeah, where, magic. Yes, yeah, magic, magic causes all sorts of bizarre things to happen, and our monster books are filled with the bizarre. Yeah, so uh, when Mike Merles was on the show, one of the things I had to admit and get absolution for was the fact that I had not actually fully read the monster manual at that point. Oh, boy. Um, but I am, I am happy to say now that I have read the monster manual of Olo's Guide and Morden Kanan's cover to cover. Excellent. Uh, and and yeah, that that is something that in the last year, you know, I've been playing a D and D a long time. A lot of people have been playing D and D a long time. And what I'm finding is that really doesn't matter too much. We're learning so much as we go. That um, and and one of the things that I've really picked up in the last year is just how much value there is outside of the stat block for all of the stuff that's inside these books. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, so that 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 one in particular resonated a lot with me. That if you're having trouble finding you know, finding an idea for an adventure, you pick a monster, read its, read its text and you could build sometimes campaigns. You know, I had a yeah. entire one to 20 null campaign in my head <laughs> you know, after reading yeah. the null section in, in yeah. Bolo's guide. Yeah. Um, so, I, uh, I, sorry. So I, I, I did that just, just to give a quick example. Um, recently at stream of many eyes, I was backstage DMing for the DMs and the adventure that I wrote really was just an example of me paging through the monster manual, re reminding myself some of the stories that we tell in that book. And I came across the Kuatoa, and I've always loved the story we give about <laughs> Kuatoa <laughs> making their own gods. Love it, yeah. And, and I knew I wanted this, whatever story I was going to tell to be in the city of Waterdeep, and I wanted it to tie in with Dragon Heist. And I knew in Dragon Heist there was near the docks, I don't want to give too much away, uh, but near the docks, there is this uh, parade and, a, and you know circus animals and whatnot and floats in this parade. And I thought, what if there was a float in the parade that a group of Kuatoa had decided was a god? And so that was my whole adventure, that in this parade in Dragon Heist, there was this statue of a merboy, not a mermaid, but a merboy, that this group of of Kuatoa had decided was called Merboy Destroyer of Worlds. <laughs> it was starting to be turn into a god, and that was that was the whole adventure is having to deal with this Merboy statue turning into a god, and that just came from me rereading the Kuatoa entry in the Monster Manual. That is awesome. So I, I have to bring it up. It's not related to monsters, and 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 not to Waterdeep at all. What what is that hanging over your uh, your 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 left shoulder there? Is that is that was that just was that just up there? Is that just to break up the white space? <laughs> so that looks, that so, looks familiar for some reason. Yeah. So Greg Greg Tito, knowing I was going to uh, be on this show, he came in and put uh, the map of Waterdeep behind me, and this is the map uh, that appears as a poster map in uh, Dragon Heist. It's awesome. Now everybody can can you know take a snapshot and zoom way in yeah. and get all the spoilers about Waterdeep. <laughs> and this this map is crazy detailed. Uh, awesome. You almost, in some cases, need a magnifying glass to see some of the street <laughs> names. Uh, Chris Perkins put the the tags on, and after I was reviewing the map, I said, "Chris, you went a little bonkers." <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so I mentioned before that Mike Merles had on on Happy Fun Hour had uh, sat down and actually built a monster from scratch. He built the Blazing Skeleton. Uh, how much did his process there mirror the process that you guys typically go through to build monsters for, you know, published products like Morning Canaan's? So the monster process varies depending on uh, the book that we're working on. Uh, sometimes, for instance, if we're working on an adventure, we'll start with 
often an NPC or a villain group. And we then need to build monsters that match that sort of story that we have. Uh, often, because we're doing adventure design, we also need to hit uh, particular challenge rating targets. Like we know, hey, this part of the adventure where these these creatures show up uh, is going to be for characters around fifth level. And so then that will influence sort of the CR decisions we make and some of the other decisions having to do with the creature. Um, other times uh, we will just have sort of a vague general idea, especially if we're do, designing a new monster for a book like Volo's Guide or Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. And we might go through several cycles of thinking first of concept, then writing up a few abilities, going to our CR calculator to see what actual CR we just generated. And then, then we'll do a reality check and say, okay, we, we don't want these to be more powerful than ogres, but oh my God, they're way more powerful. So now we need to adjust uh, because we not only look at what is the CR, but then we also do a reality check on just in terms of the D&D multiverse, where is this creature coming in in terms of our world building? Because there is a there's an element to monster design that is also about the broader world because we're saying something about the D&D multiverse when something shows up and it's CR 23 uh, you know, we were saying, OK, this is one of the most powerful things in the multiverse. Does that stack up with other things we've said? Uh, like if we say, all right, these this particular group of dragons are the most powerful things in the multiverse. And now we just came out with 50 monsters that are all more powerful than them. You know, so we we actually care about that kind of thing uh, when we're doing our monster design. Uh, so it. It tends to be an iterative process, like so much that we do, like we might draft a monster like you saw Mike do in the Happy Fun Hour. Uh, we might then play test it a few times, make some adjustments based on the play test, go back to the CR calculator a few times, adjust numbers based on the use of that calculator uh, until, you know, after we cycle through several times, we end up with the version that you see in the books. Um, the CR calculator, calculator I'm, I mentioned, I believe Mike talked about a little bit in the Happy Fun Hour. Um, that is the calculator we have used for every monster book and adventure of fifth edition. Uh, and I've mentioned before in public that the Dungeon Master's Guide's um, monster building guidelines are an extrapolation of that calculator. So it's really sometimes people using the guidelines in the Dungeon Master's Guide will be puzzled by what's in one of our books. But it's important to remember, we don't build monsters in official books using the guidelines in the Dungeon Master's Guide. We build them using our calculator that those guidelines are based on, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, are, there, are there examples of where they're, where they're off from one another? So the, the main difference between them is we have way more uh, sort of uh, minor uh, control and the ability to make small adjustments in the calculator then you can do easily by hand using the guidelines in the Dungeon Master's Guide because our calculator adjusts everything on the fly. So I can sometimes, let's say I want to nudge something from CR3 to CR4, I can go into our calculator and just add a couple hit points at a time until, all right, we just you know nudged over into uh, the next CR, or I can you know go in the other direction. Uh, also, because the guidelines in the DMG tell you that CR is really all about averaging both offensive abilities and defensive abilities. Well, our calculator does all of that for us on the fly. Uh, mm -hmm. we, can, we can put in the monster's hit points, its AC, uh, its saving throw bonuses, uh, the average damage it does each round, uh, we can also we also have a whole bank of toggles where we can put in all right it applies this condition and it can do it this many times per round all of those things affect CR uh, and we can then often use the calculator to help us make decisions about what elements are going to stay or go inside a monster sometimes um, actually almost all the time when I'm doing my final review of monsters and, and when I'm deciding what what is the final form this monster is going to have in a book? Uh, almost always I want to cut something because usually monsters in their earlier versions are a smidge more complicated than they should be. 
And so I will often look for something in the stat block that is sort of the least uh, challenge rating relevant, also the least story relevant, and boot it out of the stat block. And the calculator will help me determine uh, what's sort of the least relevant thing here uh, in the stat block. Sometimes I will leave non-relevant things in terms of CR in a stat block for story reasons, uh, because story trumps everything else. Uh, and so that's why sometimes monsters will have bizarre things in them. And, and ultimately those things have zero effect on the monster CR, but they're there because the story demands that they're there. Um, or it can also, it's funny, it could be the art demands that they're there. <laughs> uh, because some, that's also another element that goes into monster design, uh, especially final monster design, is we always do a, a review at the end to make sure that the stat blocks are actually matching the art. Uh, and we've made some last minute design decisions when we realize, oh, this painting has things in it that are not reflected in the stat block at all. And then we'll redesign the monster so that it, the stat block now reflects what's in the painting. Is, is this why the Winter Eladrin has such a sad bow? <laughs> I knew the sad <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. Rudy, so, don't cut me off. I know I told uh, you to cut me off. All right, I'm monster. here. Just if need be. <laughs> one, give me one. He brought it up. So, nice. so, so, so that, that bow is spectacularly pathetic. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, there's, there. There, I, I'm not. I'm not going to try to pretend it's not sad. It is a sad, sad longbow attack. Uh, and quite honestly, it could be better. Um, like if I were, if I were adjusting it today, I'd say well, we can make that thing go up a bit, uh, because the bow right now is not relevant to the Aladrin CR. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's really just there, a because. There's a bow in the art. I know that was that was the clue. Like I never thought about. That. I had to go look. I was looking up D and D Beyond while you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> and a, sa a saddle lantern holding a bow. Yeah, and it's also it's also essentially there as a stand-in for like a garbage cantrip, um, because you know often cantrip would be so much better. I know. I know. <laughs> It's it's one of those things I look at it and it's like, yeah, we really it really could have been better. But because it's not actually doing any harm right. to the monster's effectiveness, it's not it's not technically an error. But yes, file that under like ooh. elf jaming. Yeah, that, that could James certainly be better. better. <laughs> but one point, one point less than a goblin. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but sorry. But again, that 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 winter Eladrin is designed as a uh, a beguiling spellcaster, and in in many ways, that Winter Labyrinth is going to be very sad if they're resorting to using that bow. <laughs> yeah, I mean they they really fall into that almost four E style controller role, right? Like yes, they're yeah. they're mere they're like a pillar of sadness, and they just yeah. stand there, and everyone's you know everyone's sad, and that controls the you know well their buddies the 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 summer Aladrin are killing everyone. Yeah, yeah, and the winter the. The Winter Eladrin are a great example, and so it's why I, I, I beforehand I encourage you to bring them up because they're a great example of a monster that, in the very design, is not just a sack of hit points. The Winter Eladrin is more than a typical monster, a walking story. Because if you look at if you look at that aura they have, and because if you if you skim past that aura, you're gonna actually miss what makes the Winter Eladrin terrifying and why they are the CR that they are. They have this massive aura where they just charm people all around them. And it is a charm that is harder to break than most charms in the game. Because most, they have disadvantage on all saves, right? Yeah, and most charms in the game are shut off uh, simply when someone like takes damage from uh, the charmer. Even that doesn't do it automatically with the Winter Eladrim. Uh, and so the Winter Eladrim can shut down a potentially huge number of people. You can imagine a Winter Eladrim walking into, you know, <laughs> Waterdeep is behind me, walking into right. you know, a plaza in Waterdeep and just like, no, none of you are going to attack me. Yeah. And, you don't, want him, you don't want him showing up at your bar. No, you don't lose customers. What's going to be sad? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, a uh, question for you, um, and particularly kind of getting back to the well. So, one quick side question about the um, 
uh, the magic wizard spreadsheet and the uh, the the rules that we have in the DMG. Uh, does one tend to lean higher in power than the other, or is it really just sort of shaving off the rough edges and some of the details? So uh, the DMG guidelines, uh, because because of dealing with averages the way it does, actually tends, I have found, to lead to monsters with more hit points and dealing more damage than the spreadsheet results in. Because gotcha. again, the spreadsheet allows us to do very small adjustments that will just push something over slightly over the line. Whereas using the guidelines in the DMG, things move from one CR to another with sort of larger chunks of number, if that makes sense. Sure. Rather, you know, rather than, rather than that adjustment of three pushing it over the line, the DMG guidelines might say, well, this adjustment of 10 pushes it over the line. That can have a pretty large effect, uh, and a sort of large accumulative effect uh, when you're doing a monster. Right. And, and, yeah. and again, those guidelines... We created them for DMs to uh, homebrew things for their own use. Those guidelines are not there to create official content. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. That that's that's what our spreadsheet is for, and that and it's a spreadsheet that we share with freelancers who work for us creating official content. Yeah. So um, a fellow Paul who runs the website Blog of Holding. So I was in my two week Morden Kanan super deep dive mm -hmm. where, you know, like I said, I read it cover to cover and um, uh, pick things out and I kind of highlighted and then I'd, I'd, I'd have little spasms on Twitter about particular monsters like poor Hootagen and the winter Ladrin. Um, and uh, Paul seems to be uh, OCD like I am. And I think he actually hand wrote all the stats into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, for both the Monster Manual and Morden Canons. Mm -hmm. And then we did all kinds of like regression analysis and all sorts of things. And he was comparing it specifically to uh, like the DMG stats. And I remember many times I kind of bring something up and then um, people would sort of uh, uh, kind of explain, well, you know, you might be missing this one line that's in the DMG that might have lowered it slightly. So yeah. most of them seemed pretty, my, you know, my, my end result after a lot of time was they're pretty close. Like, yeah. A, b both yeah. books, the power of them are pretty close to one another. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're close enough to the DMG that given the wild swings that we have rolling on a 20 sided die, they're not really gonna, they're not really gonna matter that much. Yeah, yeah. The differences aren't gonna matter that much. Yeah, we find the DMG gu guidelines are close enough uh, to to what our spreadsheet generates. And again, it's the, the, the spreadsheet we're using, uh, the math, it's exactly the same. Uh, as it was for the monster manual, as it is for every book we're doing today. Yeah. I also learned another valuable lesson that if, if both Dan Dillon and James Hayek tell you you're wrong, you're probably wrong. <laughs> uh, now, if Dan Dillon and James Hayek both think you're right, it might also mean you're right. Um, now, 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 something something that might have uh, led to your initial impression that that something was different about the Morden Canaan's monsters you're, you were onto something, uh, and and I know when you sent me questions in advance, you wanted to ask me if like something has changed, you know, with monsters we did in the monster manual and, and monsters. Yeah, now. I'm, about ask, I'm about to ask that next. <laughs> oh, okay. well, I'm sorry, I, I scooped. No, no, go ahead. Well, let me let me let me just frame the question a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. my 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 big question was inside Watsi, have you guys? Yeah, have you guys kind of either changed your philosophies or tweaked your philosophies towards monster design from the monster manual, which you probably wrote five years ago at this point, right? Mm -hmm. To you know, Morden Canons and the monsters we're seeing today. You know, what 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 philosophical changes have you have you had since then, if any? So so our core philosophy has not changed one whit, and our core philosophy is story first. Uh, we and. If, if people hear me say that and they might wonder, well, why is Jeremy saying that? Here's what I mean by that. Uh, when we come to a monster design, we do not come to it thinking, what are the trickiest game mechanics we could design? Instead, it's what is this monster story and what mechanics can we design to express that story in a way that's not too onerous for the DM to run at the table? I say that because sometimes we have come up with some really interesting game mechanics that once we try them out, way too complicated for the DM. Because uh, something I always remind designers anytime I do a design training session on designing for monsters is I always remind them, a DM might be running 
three, five, six different types of monsters, even in the same encounter, don't kill the DM by having a bunch of overcomplicated abilities in all of these monsters. Now, we give an out to legendary monsters. They're supposed to be crazy. Uh, they're supposed to often be complex. Uh, so that's why you'll often see legendary creatures having a higher complexity level than you see in, a, in another monster. And that's by design. And, has, and that's, again, been true all the, way back to, uh, all the way back to the monster manual. Now, something has changed a little bit over time. And that is we are more and more willing, since we have the monster manual as a foundation, to play around with our design and let a monster's CR reside in things other than its hit points and its damage. Mm -hmm. uh, so the monsters in the monster manual were designed to be as straightforward as possible. And because of that, when you analyze the monsters in that book, most of their CR is coming from uh, their hit points, their AC, their damage, uh, and also their accuracy. In later books, especially as we've refined the interface for our CR spreadsheet, um, and really, uh, that sounds fancy. All it really did is we took all of those CR adjustments that are in that massive table in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and those are all just toggles for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so like we can click Legendary uh, Resistance, and that adjustment that the Dungeon Master's Guide mentions, our spreadsheet does that for us automatically. <laughs> we have basically started to play more with uh, the application of certain conditions, certain resistances, uh, you know, larger quantities of saving throw, um, saving throw bonuses. We started to play with those more as a way to adjust CR so that you can end up with monsters that give a variety of different play experiences. You end up with monsters like the Winter Eladrim, who is certainly not a damage powerhouse, but is a battlefield control powerhouse uh, because of how they're shutting people down. Uh, and one of the one of the things that uh, we do in our monster design is convert certain conditions into what I refer to as virtual damage. Mm. Uh, that, that is something the Dungeon Master's Guide doesn't go into very much. But once you realize we're doing that, a lot of our design starts to make more sense. Uh, here's a great example of it. If there is an effect that paralyzes a creature and uh, or otherwise deprives a person of their turn, uh, we often just for shorthand, we refer to it as turn denial. Mm -hmm. uh, we How we account for that as virtual damage when we're figuring out a monster CR is we look for the lowest level spell in the game that applies that condition and we, we basically cause that effect to deal an amount of virtual damage equal to the average damage for a spell of that level. For example, this turn denial thing. The, the standard way of doing that in the spell list is hold person. And so we then look at, at that level, what is uh, sort of icon an iconic amount of damage output, scorching ray. And so if you see a monster that the only thing it's doing is, is it paralyzes somebody, when we do our CR calculation, that paralysis is given the same damage uh, value as, is, as, if, as if that creature were casting Scorching Ray. Um, and so we do a lot more of that these days where we are, where the monsters are dealing what we, again, refer to as virtual damage. And that virtual damage or other various defensive capabilities are having a larger contribution to the monster CR than just straightforward damage or straightforward defense. That's great. That's great. Um, so I want to I want to jump to boss monsters for a minute because <laughs> I know that. Um, so I wondered I wondered for a while if this was you know just something I had trouble with. Um, so I kind of reached out and ran a very unscientific Twitter poll on how people felt about high CR monsters in particular and whether people felt that they were either too easy or just right or, or too hard. Mm -hmm. And it came back with about three out of four of the respondents saying that they were too easy, mm -hmm. um, which has kind of been my experience as well. And then I kind of thought about, you know, Matt Mercer when he ran Vecna and, you know, people, of course, dove deep into those stats, just re reverse engineering it from the show. And Vecna had like 1,100 hit points and three ninth level spells. Um, so what can 
DMs do for, for DMs who are running high level D&D games and they and they hit these high level bosses um, beyond the things that you've talked about with being able to scale things up uh, with the numbers, right? We can we can max damage and we can max hit points. Um, what are some other ways for us to run effective boss monsters at the real high end, like demon princes, devil lords, you know, ancient dragons and these and these really, you know, a Sararak, right? I don't want a Sararak to be beaten in a round. Right, right. So uh, this actually goes back to my my tip earlier in the show that monsters are more than bags of hit points. And here's what I mean by that. A boss is never meant in our design to be encountered in a white room. A mm -hmm. boss uh, should be encountered, uh, especially if they're a, a demon lord or some kind of archmage genius. They're almost always going to be the ones who choose the battlefield, and they're going to choose a battlefield that is advantageous to them. You know, so if if they're being met in their throne room, you most likely have gone through many ranks of guards. You've faced traps, so you're often going to arrive uh, tuckered out. Um, so here's where encounter sequencing is very important. If a DM makes it so that, hey, you're fighting the boss at the start of the day and you're totally fresh, that, that, that encounter is going to go very differently than if you finally stagger into the throne room after fighting through, you know, eight waves of guards and now you face the boss. So encounter sequencing is, in, is important. The setting of the battle is important. Uh, usually the boss is going to want to be in their lair. Also, most bosses are not going to appear alone. Uh, they're even, even if, let's say, you decide the, the adventurers are going to start the day and they're going to go right into the boss battle, well, that boss is most likely going to have a lot of help in that fight. Uh, and so a, a more specific way to get at what I'm talking about is when you look at the encounter building guidelines in the Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, where we talk about um, sort of easy, medium, or hard encounters, push hard in the hard direction. Uh, you know, like, because this is the boss. Uh, you know, th this this should not be easy. And don't build it assuming that the players are going to succeed on their first go. Uh, they might have to flee. Like, it's okay if you even make it what what our encounter building guidelines would consider to be deadly. Uh, it's, it's not a bad thing story-wise if the group realizes they have to flee and try this again. Here's the other thing. Many boss creatures have ways to escape. Uh, my favorite example of this is the vampire. Uh, the vampires in fifth edition, and this is by design, many of them, if, if they just stuck around and fought, again, like a big sack of hit points, uh, there are many ways where you could take them out and they might not feel like a very great threat. Here's the thing. I've been using vampires now for the entire life of fifth edition, and I have yet to have a group be able to defeat one. Uh, <laughs> seriously. And, I, and, I, and I've run the vampires actually without even uh, any of the adjustments I've talked about. I've run the vampires using the stat blocks as written in the monster manual, and I have yet to have a group be able to defeat one. The reason for that, for that is that I play them like the geniuses that most of them are. Uh, First off, they're not going to stick around in a fight if they're losing it. That's, and that's true not only for vampires, but that's true for all bosses. Unless a boss is defending something that is the most precious thing to them in existence, they're not going to stick around. Most bosses, when they get to about midway in their hit points, they're going to get out of there. Uh, and that's what I, I almost always have my vampires do. I have night hags do that. It's been very difficult for my players to defeat any of the night hags I've thrown out there. Uh, Cause actually a night hags are a great example of DMs sometimes missing something in the stat block. They miss, wait, night hags can plane shift. And, <laughs> and so usually if you know my hags are on the ropes, poof, they're out of there. Uh, or even just uh, at the D and D in a castle event that I was at recently, uh, my players were fighting a witch uh, who was a powerful spell caster they had actually some amazing rounds of damage and she was on the ropes, but in her stat block, she had greater invisibility prepared and she also had Misty Step prepared. So when her hit points got low enough, uh, she's a genius and wants to survive. 
I had her cast greater invisibility and teleported out, and then she booked it out of there and she escaped. They were never able to defeat her. Uh, and that's, that's how I play my villains, unless again, they're truly backed into some kind of existential corner. Like if they leave this room, they're gonna die, or you know, their, their master plan will fall apart and everything they've you know, lived for is about to be undone. Unless those things are true, my bosses do not stick around. Uh, and, and so that, it, it is often a mighty accomplishment in my games when, my, when uh, the, the player characters in the, in the campaign manage to finally take out one of my bosses. <laughs> because cause that boss has got to have really be on the ropes for them to finally be defeated. Um, the other thing is I have my bosses learn. Uh, that's the beauty of, of it being a human run game rather than run by a computer. My bosses pay attention. Uh, over the course of a campaign, especially if uh, people have been encountering the minions of a particular mastermind or other villain, those minions are reporting back. They're reporting on the capabilities they saw. You know, if, if, if the minions managed to escape and they saw, all right, this group has these spellcasters in it, has this fighter, has this rogue, the villain and the villain's minions, they're going to start adjusting. They're going to start coming back with ways to foil the player characters. They're going to learn. Uh, and I really always, I love doing that of having the bosses get smarter, have their minions get smarter. Uh, and also sometimes even use the player characters tricks against them. Uh, one of the bit, bits of advice I love to give is if you're, if your player characters come up with some amazing alpha strike combo, you know, on round, round one, uh, you know, they managed to pull off, you know, the certain class features combined with certain spells and just an insane amount of damage is done. If any NPCs, villainous or otherwise, were observing that, there's a good chance someone in the setting is now going to do that same thing back. <laughs> uh, and, and so I often love doing that to, again, show it's a living environment. Uh, or Orcus's Divine Smite. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to destroy them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent. Uh, so we have uh, Rudy Basso, our guardian angel, is on our, our channel as well. And uh, Rudy has been watching the Twitch chat, and we've uh, had some questions on Twitter. So we wanted to take a few, a few questions from the audience. Uh, Rudy, what do you have? Hello, yes. Thank you to everyone who's asked questions. Uh, there have been some great ones. I'm going to choose some of my favorites. Hopefully I get to all of them. We'll see. First off, Danny Wilkinson on Twitter how many times do you put a monster on the table against players before it makes it into a book? What is the testing process for a monster after you think you have its stats in CR correct? Uh, so that is different uh, for every product. Uh, if, if it's an adventure, uh, the monsters uh, will often get tested uh, many, many times over the months because we have many NDA play testers who are, who are playing with those monsters. Uh, we often have internal groups who are playing through drafts of the adventure. So those monsters often go through many, many cycles of play. When it comes to a big monster book like Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, oh, then it's all over the place. Some of those monsters might see, well, again, they're going to our NDA play testers. Uh, some of those play testers, to be honest, don't actually play test everything. I know that sometimes they just read, read it and give us our feedback, which is valuable. Um, and then some of those groups do indeed play through uh, encounters using all of these monsters. We sometimes with a monster, particularly if it's a monster that we expect to be used a lot, we might do multiple encounters in-house with that monster. We might have other monsters that uh, might only see one use uh, before it goes into print. Um, and that, that's partly because that monster might be so simple and hew so closely to our CR expectations, there's really not a whole lot we need to test. Uh, because at this point, with our, our CR calculator and the other monsters we've designed, if a new monster is very close to, say, a monster in the monster manual, it might not need to go through much testing, uh, if any. I mean, we do have occasional monsters where we don't need to play test them before we put them into a book because it's like this is this is essentially a, a different combination of the abilities we've done before. We know how these abilities work. We know what it feels like in play, uh, and we know what the CR implications are. Excellent. Uh, Rudy, what else you got? 
Sure, Mason Williams on Twitter, and he's also in Twitch chat. Hello, Mason. When designing monsters that are likely to be bosses but don't have legendary traits, what consideration is taken for action economy? Is the assumption that there will always be multiple creatures in a fight, for example, the giant lords in Storm King's Thunder? So if the creature is not a legendary creature, the default assumption is that it will show up with friends. Uh, it, we really only design legendary creatures uh, as the ones who basically you might meet them by themselves. Uh, you can certainly treat a very high CR creature as a solo creature, especially if it's high CR relative to your group. And uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything in one of its tables gives the sort of like solo monster table and gives you a CR to shoot for if you're gonna have a monster show up by itself. And usually that CR is quite a bit higher than the player character CR. Um, Cause if you get this, if the CR is too close to the player's level and just one monster shows up, usually that monster is going to get squashed uh, because just as the default expectation is that D and D adventurers are showing up as a group, the same is true for monsters that they're showing up as groups uh, again, unless it's a legendary creature, in which case that creature is kind of a, a walking uh, Voltron group. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's why it has, you know, legendary actions and all of that. Excellent. Rudy, what else you got? What are some of your, and Mike, you can answer this too. What are some of your favorite or most terrifying monster traits or abilities like pack tactics or life drain, things like that? Um, I think this is partly because for the last couple of years I've been running a gothic horror campaign. I have found that uh, I've, I've been able to terrify my players with all sorts of things, mostly in kind of the role, role playing sphere. But what's interesting is I have found few abilities terrify people more than hit point drain uh, or being mind controlled, uh, especially long-term mind control. Not the kind of charm that just lasts for a few rounds. This, by the way, is another reason I love vampires because they can charm you and you can be, you know, their, their enforced buddy for quite some time. That can sow a lot of wonderful paranoia, <laughs> in especially, especially a horror campaign. Uh, but even in a non-horror campaign, uh, hit point drain, uh, you know, it's something we, we've we had since the Monster Manual. It, it is a, it's an oldie but goodie. Uh, it, it, few things terrify people more than seeing their maximum hit points going down. Yeah, I, I, I joke that to me, the most dangerous monster in Morden Canaan's is the young Kruthik. Uh, because it is CR 1-8, but it has pack tactics. Oh, you yes. Know? And, and to me, like these yeah. burrowing, tiny little burrowing monsters that, that you know, you're going to throw a ton of them, you know. Yeah. I was like, I kind of wish every monster was as tough as these guys would be for a level one. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I love low CR creatures like those Kruthix uh, that have that little element of terror because... That's something we do in some of our low CR monsters to make them usable for a long time. Right. Because as soon as you put pack tactics in some a monster that low CR, what that means is you can that that monster is going to take longer to go out of style than a maybe a low CR monster that lacks a trait like pack tactics. Uh, Rudy, what other questions you got? Uh, so that last one was from Short Man Ian as well. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Uh, we have one from Twitch, Johnny Utah ninety nine. What are some of your favorite combat systems in non D and D RPGs? Mm. Uh, so specifically, tabletop RPGs or video? Uh, yeah, RPGs? tabletop. Oh, yeah, tabletop. Uh, so I have played uh, more RPGs than I can count, both of the <laughs> both of the tabletop uh, variety and the uh, video game uh, variety. I just love RPGs. Uh, so in recent years, so I think one of the combat systems I was most fascinated by in the last two years uh, was the abstract combat system in the Japanese uh, tabletop RPG, Ryutama. Uh, it's this, this RPG that's actually mostly about peaceful journeys, but it has this abstracted combat system uh, that deals with sort of different zones rather than uh, concrete measurements. 
Uh, and I think they did a really good job of it uh, and, and, and really fascinated me. Um, and I'm often fascinated by games that do sort of more abstracted combat system systems compared to the very concrete uh, measured out combat system of D&D. And part of the reason for my interest in those systems is I am so, uh, you know, up to up to my forehead in Dungeons and Dragons every day of the week. And it's this game I love. Usually when I go to other games, I want them to not be like D&D. Uh, because essentially, if they feel too much like D&D, I'm just like, well, I have D&D, you know. <laughs> you know, I have it. You know, it's it. it it, if I want more D&D, I'll play more D&D. So I often, I'm most excited often by these games that just do something wildly different, whether it's with their combat system or with their, uh, with their other rule systems. Uh, another RPG recently that I really loved reading uh, was Blades in the Dark uh, because, again, of some really interesting uh, abstract ways of dealing not only with combat but uh, even with some of the exploration elements of the game. Excellent. Uh, Rudy, we got time for one more question. One. Uh, what? How about you, Mike? For that last question, what else do you like? Oh man, um, I've I've really enjoyed Numenera. Uh, I don't get to play it nearly as much as as I would like. It's it's. I like to say that in a parallel universe, I'm playing a lot of Numenera, and I like that one just because of how simple the design is for challenges. That everything has a level, and you know, you immediately know like what the die, die rolling is going to be. Um, you can make a monster just in your head and it can make any NPC in any challenge in your head. And that, that yeah, it's the one that immediately comes to mind, but that's also cause I just got all the books like today. So you know, it's sort of the most recent, it's sort of the most recent, the most recent one. Um, I don't know. Well, okay, I mean, so I'm a huge fan of, of abstract combat when it comes to distances. Mm -hmm. And I think 13th age really kind of knocked it out of the park with that, that, you know, that whole idea of, um, you know, how many guys land in a fireball? Well, roll, you know, roll 2d3. And if you're willing to hit your friends, roll 2d6. And that's how many guys you can get a fireball. I kind of like that, that, you know, abstract mechanic that sort of gets away from, you know, the nitpicky moving miniatures around to angle a, a lightning bolt exactly right. And, and I've custom built D and D monsters that way where I'm like, I'm going to have a lich throw lightning bolts, but instead of he has to line people out of in a beam. He can hit any two targets he can see mm -hmm. and do the equivalent of lightning bolt damage. And that way, nobody can argue about whether or not they were in, within the line of effect or not. Yeah. So, um, yeah. We could, we could do a whole other show just on uh, theater of the mind combat. I, I would uh, love to do a whole other show on theater of the mind. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite topics. <laughs> well, we sh we should schedule that. Oh man! If you're serious, I'll schedule it. <laughs> well, it it it's the kind of thing that I get enough questions about it over the years. Uh, it would be fun to do a deep dive into it. Sure, uh, sure, great. Because I I could then share some of my strategies as a person who now mostly does theater of the mind. Yeah, I find it very interesting. Uh, you and I know Mike Merles runs a lot of theater of the mind as well. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to me that that so many people that work at Y and we've seen Chris Perkins obviously runs a lot of theater of the mind. We we watch it all the time. Yeah. Um, so it'd be very interesting to hear how. Uh, how the guys at, at Wizards do it. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, in fact, none none of the core design team regularly uses miniatures anymore. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah, I thought Chris Perkins had this enormous like fifty gallon drum of miniatures that he'd wheel around in a cart. So he, uh, this might amaze you, he within the past year got rid of almost all those. Miniatures. Oh my god! Yeah. Wow. He he is. Such is he is he independently wealthy now? <laughs> no, he gave them away as gifts. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I so I still have all of my miniatures because I still like to break them out for certain set piece encounters. Right. Uh, yeah, and again, cool. we but we can talk about that in in a different yeah. session. Awesome. Uh, uh, Rudy, uh, one last question. Sure. From Q's fan two two four on Twitch chat. How do you stat up Fai Chen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you mean Fai Chen, who uh, is the the uh, magic item distributor? Yes, the trading <laughs> vendor. Yeah, <It's> totally, <laughs> totally riddled with magic items, but <laughs> but no proficiencies. Right, right. Uh, oh, so it's funny when I do NPCs, especially NPCs who uh, are high in story importance and low in combat importance, I almost never stat them up in my own in my home game. I will often just roll dice and make up what happens. Uh, I, I will often assume they just 
they have averages and everything, uh, and I just roll with it. Um, but now, now I'm, now I'm pondering how would I stat him up? That this will be a to be continued uh, thing. <laughs> we'll come back. We'll come back to that in another episode. <laughs> but no, I honestly, the my serious answer is that unless, especially as a DM, unless I'm designing something that somebody else is going to use. I will rarely bother fully statting something out. Um, uh, I will I will either use uh, a stat block that already exists and reskin it, uh, or I will come up with just the stats that are actually important uh, for the NPC. Uh, because I don't assume that most of my NPCs are going to get slaughtered. Uh, and then if if they do enter into unexpected battle, there's almost always some stat block that already exists that I can use. Because the secret is, this is one of the, the many advantages of being one of the lead designers of the game, is I can fill books with things I want from my home camp. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so one, of, one of the reasons uh, we keep having these NPC appendices in our monster books, going all the way back to the monster manual, is because I wanted them from my campaign <laughs> because I get so tired of having to come up with guard stat blocks, noble stat blocks, you know, random cultist stat blocks. So these things are really here. And Chris Perkins, he wanted them as well. So Chris and I, when working on the monster manual, we're like, we're just going to put all these stat blocks in because we want them when we're DMing. And we figured, well, if we want them, probably all, all the other DMs want them too. Uh, yeah, they are. Those, that section in my monster manual is beat to hell. Yeah. Because they are by far the monsters I use the most. I don't know how many times I've thrown cultists out there. Oh, it's you the know. same for me. I, I use the NPC stat blocks more than any other monsters in D&D. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the mage, man, I use that mage stat block all the time. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay. Jeremy, this has been an absolute wonderful time. Uh, I always I always love talking to you when, when, I, when I get the opportunity. And I really thank you for taking the time to, uh, to sit with us today and, and dig deep into this. Love Every time you're on, you know, Dragon Talk, I have to stop whatever I'm doing and, and, you know, sit and listen. I'll pull the car over to the side of the road and be 45 minutes late for work so I can listen to what you have to say. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just fantastic to have you on. And thank you for, for all the hard work that you're doing. We're all benefiting from it every day. Well, those of us who think about it and play every day, but yeah, well, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful time. So I really, I really thank you for coming on the show. Oh, uh, I have one special announcement, uh, unrelated to Jeremy. Uh, so Gen Con is next week. Jeremy, are you, are you going, are you going to be able to make it to Gen Con? So this is actually the first Gen Con I am missing in 10 years. Wow. Yeah. It's a, we, we missed it. We've missed it, uh, the last couple of times, just hotel problems. But, uh, anyway, there will be, so, uh, this show is on the don't split the podcast network, uh, with, uh, Rudy and, uh, James Sertacasso and many others. And we are going to be having a panel uh, on Saturday, 5 to 6 p.m. in the Lucas Oil meeting room number four. And I will be there and a bunch of other bunch of other folks from uh, the Don't Split the Podcast Network will be there. So please come on by and say hello. And uh, we'll talk about all this stuff. Um, Rudy, am I missing anything else? Thank thank you, Rudy, very much for, as always, for- Thank for, you, uh, yeah. For no. And uh, thanks to the Twitch audience for, for coming along and, and for everybody who asked questions. And sorry, we couldn't get to them all. We'd have you here for another two hours if we did. But uh, thank you again. And uh, everybody have a great night. All right. Bye, everyone.